Um, so I'm going to talk now about the MT data that we have further out in the west um, and just kind of talking a bit about what that shows. Just to put a bit into context, what I'm showing here is actually the Gawler Craton, so the area that we do know a lot about. And what you can just see here on the left-hand side, really this image to focus on is um, a resistivity depth slice at 20 kilometers derived from the Auslamp MT data. So you can see a bit the station coverage is quite broad and really what everyone got excited are these sort of conductive margins of the Gawler Craton, so they're really extensive in the IOCG belt. The obvious question is, and you can see that we have very little data what happens on the western margin, that's really what this talk's gonna be about. Um, there's already some information um, across the western margins and a bit further uh, to the west from there onwards. Uh, that's part of the workshop that we held last year in December. So there's already uh, some papers out and some results there. Um, there's also some other um, data that sort of just straddles a bit the 3D inversion data out here. So some of the yellow sites are older, long period data, very sparsely spaced. Um, then there's also existing this Fowler profile, we call it, which is just along the coast here. Um, but all the green and yellow, uh, blue sites are completely new. So the green ones are the Oslamp MT data that we've just collected towards the end of last year. And we just finished processing and just starting modeling now. So I can't really show any results of that yet. Uh, but you know, stay tuned in the next few months where we will probably get something out. That's a co-funded project between GA, um, GSSA, and also University of Adelaide has been involved in that. And what I'm mostly going to talk about today is actually the EG1 MT line extending on from what I've already presented at the workshop last year. So that goes across the Campana province and even over into the Madura Albany Fraser uh, province further west. That's a broadband MT profile so it's designed to image more the upper crust or actually the entire crust in much higher resolution. Uh, the site spacing there has been five kilometers. So that means you know anything, any features that are smaller than five kilometers um, are probably not so well resolved. Um, just want to show, nevertheless, some of the data along the profile. So on the right-hand side, you see two MT data sets um, from the broadband survey across the uh, railway line. So you can clearly see here, so apparent resistivity in phase curves, really what I want to point out is the depth to the basement. You can already see that from the data itself, the top um, plot shows in this plot against periodicity here uh, that there's a strong dip in the data at about one second, whereas data that's further out to the east, so this is towards the margin of the Gawler Craton, the dip's much at shallower feet. So what this means is that these are basically the responses of the sedimentary basin. So we kind of see from the data straight away that it's quite a bit thicker over in this area than it is here. That's one of the data sets from the Oslem site. This is the one collected right on the border here. Um, these go out to periodicities of about 10,000 seconds. That makes sure that we can image the entire lithosphere. So it gives us a lot of constraint for the regional context, I suppose. Um, so the profile I'm going to talk about today is a profile that's over 850 kilometers long and together with the um, profile that occurs across the um, EG1 East profile that we presented last year, it's on the order of about 1,300 kilometers, which I think makes it the longest MT profile in the world to date, which is quite exciting. So this is the profile um, EG1 that's been collected recently and it nicely joins up with an Albany Fraser profile just to give us a bit more of the regional context there as well. I want to highlight on two things. Uh, one of them is sort of the cover mapping because that is, is one of the outcomes from the MT. We are quite good in sort of estimating the cover thickness along that profile. Then I'm going to talk about the deeper structures as well. This here is just the data displayed in a different way. These are called the ellipse, uh, phase sensor ellipses and are plotted for a periodicity of one second. That's a periodicity that sort of maps uh, the sediments if they're quite thick or it sees through to the basement if the sediments are quite small. So what you can see here is that these uh, light colored and circular shapes are sort of indicative of sediments. This is the border here, WASA, SA, so it tells you that the sediments are thicker here and then there's thinning of sediments. And you can see a lot of distortion in these ellipses, which just means that's the basement structure. So we are basically imaging fault orientations, etc., uh, in the Madura province and also over here. And then we get a thinning of the uh, sedimentary strata as we go further towards the edge of the Gawler Craton. Um, if you look a little bit deeper, this is now 400 seconds as well and truly in the basement now. So all of the stations sensing the basement. 
what you see here, there's a nice alignment of these ellipses with um, structures. It's really striking, especially in the magnetics here. So there's a nice alignment with these um, structures that you know Tom alluded to, that are more the 860 mA um, dikes, and you know the orientation of these ellipses, which just really means this is where current preferentially flows. So electrical current likes to flow along um, fault lines, really nicely aligned. Whereas when you go across to the um, from the Modini Super Suite over to the next one, you see the sort of more structural trend where that also again aligns really well with the TMI image. So that's quite exciting. It really kind of shows really what the predominant strike orientation is with depth and where faults are aligned and which event is actually um, responsible for it. If I now look at uh, a 2D inversion profile, so we basically take, took all the data and inverted it in 2D. Um, the stations on the top. This is now a profile that just goes down to about nine kilometers. So just basically zoomed in to kind of show you what are the constraints we have on the depth of the cover. And you can see here, this is um, across this entire profile from the border here to the end of, or close to the edge of the goal is around about here. You can see it's quite conductive, um, but I'm gonna show this in comparison to some drill hole information that uh, Tom provided. So this is really along the profile here. The site sits right on top, and you know, basement's been intersected about 1,150 meters. There's quite a good correlation between the bottom of that most conductive um, feature in here, and then we call it here because it's a smooth inversion. It kind of goes from the really conductive part to what is the resistive basement. So, but the depth is, is hit quite well, and I've also run some one-dimensional models, so you basically take a station that sits right next to it, run a 1D inversion of it just to see, you know, what kind of depths do we get for different layers. And you basically run an Occam inversion, which is these sort of jaggedy lines here, and then you guess an eight-layered model from it. So it's trying to, tries to fold eight different layers into the model, so it gives a few to the sedimentary environment. Whereas, you know, if it's this value here, it means it's really conductive, that's more associated with shales. But sandstone here is slightly more resistive, but still very conductive, because it's still in red color. And then you well and truly into the basement here, and it becomes quite resistive. The 1D model also slightly overestimates the depth of the um, basement at about just over 1,200 meters. But if you look at where you know the Occam inversion kind of starts increasing in resistivity, that's just a bit shallower than that. So MT is quite good in imaging out the depth to the basement as well, on, um, and it probably should be used together with other techniques just to give it some constraint. Um, and it just kind of shows you the extensiveness of, of the basement there. And I should just go back one slide so you clearly see that towards the border here, and so it goes with the contour lines that Tom alluded to before, that there's a shallowing of the uh, depth of cover as well. So now I just want to jump right out. Um, what you see on the top there is a TMI image again, and uh, the bottom is the resistivity profile derived from basically the 850 kilometers of MT data. Uh, this now goes down to 250 kilometers depth, so we're looking at the entire lithosphere here. This is the big picture. Um, I should warn you that uh, resolution beneath conductors is not as well as you would hope. Especially this feature has to be taken with care. So I've done some, um, just some uh, uh, tests on some of the data that sit on top of this conductor and really only sensitive to about 100 kilometer, which is around about there. So there's no doubt that this feature is a bit more conductive than what's going on here, but we can't really constrain uh, this subvertical feature or the extent of it or its magnitude, I should say. Um, what becomes apparent though is when you compare that to the TMI image, and the correlation is quite remarkable. In the sense that you have the Montrebilla shear zone here. This is the western edge of the Campana province. It goes into the Maduro province. Uh, the Modini Super Suite, which uh, is related to the ultra high temperature event, which um, you know has been talked about quite a bit. And we've got the border fold, which is just sitting on the um, western margin of the Modini Super Suite, and that really nicely joins up with the feature that we see here. Again, the Montrebilla joins up there. And everything seems to be connected to a really wide-ranging lower crust of conductor. And I want to talk about this in the next slide and also put a bit um, the profile here we have for the Gola here or going across the northern part of the Fowler domain. The remarkable thing about this is that to me this looks like a craton. So if you compare this to other parts of the world where you have looking at the resistivity structure, uh, this is really resistive in um, 
in its well resistivity values, and which just usually means that you have a really thick um, lithosphere that's very dry, completely void of any um, conducting minerals, something like iron, etc., and so on. It's very depleted. And the lower crust is just really um, quite the opposite. So they kind of suggest that you may have more either fluids in there. The question is how well do you preserve fluids over such a long time? So it might actually have something to do with the mineralogy of the lower crust and then also coming up to the surface of the Mudini suite. Um, so how can you have a signature that looks a bit like a craton, like almost like an Archean craton, but then isotopically you have an oce more an oceanic signature? So how do you reconcile that? And one of the things that we thought about is the cratonization so that during the Proterozoic, um, you know, you have a lithosphere that is maybe slightly enriched, perhaps there's been subduction systems, etc. but then this ultra high temperature event melts everything, moves it up the column into the um, lower crust, uh, very much the upper mantle, and then sometimes even breaks through to the surface. And what it leaves is a really tri depleted mantle, but all the good stuff and the fertile material, um, high in potassium um, iron, actually sits around here in the lower crust and does come to the surface in places. So especially around here, the Modini Super Suite obviously has a signature that's really conductive, so that's exciting, whatever this means. Um, so that really stands out, and it's also a little bit different to the Gola Craton. The Gola Craton uh, very much well, actually has a lack of these lower crustal conductors. So it seems to have a sort of different uh, tectonic history, which we sort of know. But it is also exemplified in the MT image. So really the per pervasiveness of the lower crust conductor is really remarkable. Um, and we still have to work out more what this means, I guess. So I think what I'm, the point I'm trying to get across is that um, the fertile lower crust is most likely associated with the Modini Super Suite. This is the event that we're also seeing across the Musgrave. Um, and so I think that's quite exciting, actually. And with that, I'm going to stop. <laughs>